The way I'd like to do this review is by going through just this table of contents here. These headings, let's just look at these headings and break some things down and do some questions and answers. As you see, we have a lot of topics here. Let's see if we can go through all of these headings in a brief way, just as a general overview. And then after that, we'll start something new, inshallah ta'ala. So, the first chapter we have here is accountability, taklif, taklif, accountability, or responsibility, accountability or responsibility. We mean here, though, religious responsibility. What does responsibility mean? That means you, you are the one who has to answer. What does response mean? Response means answer. So the one who's responsible is the one who has to answer. So the first chapter here is the chapter of accountability or responsibility, religious responsibility. The reason why that's the first chapter there is because nothing is obligatory and nothing is haram without a messenger that establishes our accountability. When the messenger comes with the message, then whoever gets that message becomes accountable. And then obligations and prohibitions become relevant to that person. So that's why accountability is the first chapter there. Now, you brothers and sisters, you already know what makes someone accountable. Being sane, pubescent, and hearing the call of Islam. You already know what pubescence is. If you have a question, feel free to ask. Hearing the call of Islam is to hear that no one is God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And really, we could say an even broader statement, as opposed to saying hearing, we can say the call of Islam reached you. The call of Islam reached the person. So that includes, if you read it, for example, or maybe that was communicated through some other communication, perhaps sign language, for example. So what makes you accountable is the message of a messenger reaching you. Three things make you accountable, sanity, pubescence, and having the basic message of a prophet reach you. Those, you know all of that. And also, among what we talked about here, is the difference between the Maturidis concerning accountability and what the Ash'ari said concerning accountability. What the Ash'ari said about accountability is what I just now said to you. I started by giving you the Ash'ari saying about accountability. And if you were to teach a new person, just teach them this, which is what? Accountability is by three things, sanity, pubescence, and the basic call of Islam reaching a person. Uh, but we did mention what the Maturidis said that's different from this, which is that the Maturidis said that concerning monotheism in particular, not believing in prophethood, not believing in what's lawful or unlawful, the halal and the haram, just only and specifically, exclusively, the case of God's oneness, the case of God's oneness in particular, according to Abu Hanifa and the Maturidis, you don't need three conditions to be accountable for monotheism. You only need two to be accountable for monotheism, according to them. Sanity and pubescence. 
According to them, if you were a sane, pubescent person who worshipped a stone and you never got the message of a messenger, then you will be in hell forever. And they don't differ about other things needing three conditions of accountability. To be accountable to believe in prophets, then you need the message of a prophet. To be accountable to believe in the exclusively correct religion of Islam, then you need the message of a prophet. To be accountable to believe in God's oneness, According to them, you don't need the message of a prophet. Now, we're not going to go over all the proofs involved in this difference in opinion. Now we're just reviewing. So that's accountability and what the Maturidi said and what the Ash'ari said. Now, under this section of accountability, we have here another section here, which is ability. Ability. Now, this section of ability that we have under the chapter of accountability, usually you'll find this chapter of ability uh, in the talk about destiny. Destiny. If you look in books of Aqidah, where they talk about the ability to do something, usually this topic is covered when they talk about destiny. Here, that section, that subsection of destiny was just shifted and put here under the chapter of accountability because there's a relationship here between being able to do something and being accountable. As we have this ayah here, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not obligate a soul to do anything but what it can do. So if you're not able to do something, you wouldn't be accountable. If you don't have water, then you're not accountable to make wudu. So then you need to make tayammum. And if you don't have water or soil, then you won't be accountable to make wudu or tayammum because you're unable to. In this chapter of ability, there's a few things you want to remember here. One is that there's two types of ability. Two types of ability. The first type of ability is the real power by which you act. That's called the inner ability or the inward ability. The real power by which you can move. The power by which you move your hand. The power by which you speak or turn your head and turn your eyes and look around. This power to move and act, that's called the inner ability. That's the real ability to do something. So take note here. The belief of Ahlu Sunnah about ability is that the ability to do something exists at the time of doing it, not before you do it. The ability to do something exists at the time of doing it, not before you do it. And so if I pick up a pencil, then my ability to pick up that pencil, the real ability, my real ability to pick up this pencil, it exists at the time I pick up the pencil, not before. So that's, number one, the real ability. That's one out of two types of ability. And concerning this real ability, what's our belief? 
our belief is that the ability to do a deed exists at the time of doing the deed, not before. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that what's the other type of ability? The other type of ability is not really ability, actually. It's not really the real, it's not the real ability by which you can move and do something. Rather, the other type of ability, which is called the outward or outside ability, what that is, that's your means to do something, your tools and your means to do something. So your car, if you have a car, then that you can call that ability, the car. Or if you have money, you can call that ability because you can do something with it. If you have water, then you can call that ability. Even something bad. If you had wine or cocaine, then you could call that ability because you can do something with it. Something bad. So this, which is having means, being Yanni, having the tools to achieve something, this kind of ability is called the outward ability. And what that really is, is your means and tools to achieve something. And this exists before the deed exists. You said, is this related to the fact that there's no cause and effect? But it's not true that there's no cause and effect. There is cause and effect. If you set something on fire, it will burn. That's why you're going to like just not leave a fire in your house so you don't burn your house down. We don't say there's no cause and effect. In fact, that's the norm of this dunya. That's how Allah made the dunya normal, by cause and effect. So then we rely on those things to happen again and again and again. That's why when we get thirsty, we keep drinking water. Ah. Whoever said there's no cause and effect, then... Tell them, where did you get that from? When we say that the power to do a deed exists at the time of doing the deed, this is a way of saying we don't create our own deeds. Allah is the creator of our deeds. But that doesn't negate cause and effect. There is cause and effect. By the normal way of this dunya, so when somebody gets a headache, then he'll take some pills and he hopes that the headache will go away. That's cause and effect, Yanni. The, the thing is, though, as Muslims, we believe that Allah is the creator of the cause and creator of the effect. Akadha, the cause does not create the effect. That's, cre that's correct. There is a cause and effect. Both of them are created. You heat your pan and then you drop the egg into the pan and it starts transforming upon contact with the hot pan. So that's cause and effect. Mm. So, all right, let's keep moving then. Then the next chapter was religious evidence. Now this chapter on ability, we didn't go far there because I didn't want to confuse anybody. So we didn't read everything that's there. Now the next chapter is religious evidence. So we said that there's different types of religious evidence. We said there's documentary evidence or textual evidence. And there's intellectual evidence. And evidence for those two types of evidence Evidence for these two types of evidence is that Allah Ta'ala says,
the blasphemers will say after being put in hell, had we listened, so that means, had we taken the documentary evidence, had we taken the ayat of the Qur'an, had only we taken the hadiths of the Prophet, had only we gone by the consensus of the Muslims, had only we taken the documentary evidence, that's the meaning of, that's the proof, Yani, that's the proof from their saying, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعْ Had only we listened. أَوْ نَعْقِلْ Or thought. Had only we listened or thought. Yani, had only we used our minds. So that means there's something called intellectual evidence also. So this is Surah Al-Mulk. Surah Al-Mulk, Ayat 10, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, that's, yes, Ayat 10. Surah Al-Mulk, Ayat 10. So this is proof that there's documentary evidence and there is intellectual evidence. So both of those are type of religious evidence. And also here in this chapter about religious evidence, we said that there's four types of documentary evidence or four sources, the Qur'an, the Hadith, the consensus, and the legal comparison, the Qiyas. So Qur'an, you know, that's the book of Allah. Hadith, you know, that's the sayings of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and his doings, etc. The consensus, you know, that's the agreement of the mujtahids. And the Qiyas, that's Ijtihad, the Ijtihad of the Mujtahids. Those are our religious proofs, those four. Qiyas is a type of Ijtihad. It's the first type of Ijtihad that the Mujtahid should resort to if he can. He said, what's the difference between consensus and Qiyas? Consensus is the agreement of the top scholars when they all come to the same answer about something. Qiyas is a comparison. When a case arises and they don't find its answer explicitly in the Quran or the Sunnah or the consensus, so then they look for something similar to the case that arose. And if it's similar enough, according to the experts, not according to other than the experts, then they will give the judgment of the new case, the judgment of the established case, the case that already has precedent. They will give the new case, the judgment of the case that has precedent. That's called P.S. That's a legal comparison. So, since we said there's mental evidence, then we went to talk about the mind. So, we talked a little bit about the mind or the intellect. We said that the scholars differed. Some scholars said the intellect is an attribute. And some scholars said the intellect is actually a body. They said it's like a light. Some said it's transparent. They said it's like a transparent body. Our sheikh says that it's an attribute, that the intellect is an attribute. So that's what we go by, that the intellect is an attribute, not a body. And we looked at some of the definitions of some of the scholars of what is intellect, aql and some said that the intellect is the attribute by which you can tell the good from the bad. The animals don't have that. And some said the intellect, and I'm paraphrasing here, they said the intellect is it's like a processor. Meaning, they said your senses, you have five senses, your senses are like input. So by your eyes, you see things around you, that's input, because 
by your eyes, for example, you know there's a chair right there and there's a shoe right there that's input. But how did you make sense of that? How did you know that this one's a chair and that one's a shoe? How come it's not all jumbled up for you and you don't know what's going on? Because you have something that processes that for you. And you hear things, that's input. You hear the cars going past, for example. You hear someone close. You hear something far. You hear something loud. You hear something low. And you distinguish between all of that. How come it's not all crashing and mixed? Because you have something that processes that for you. And etc. You have five senses. Your mind processes that and, and enables you to conclude also. Your mind enables you also to conclude. It means to make leaps, to make a leap based on something to take a step. And we said also that some scholars said that the mind is in the brain or the head. And other scholars said the mind is in the heart. And that's what we learned is the strong saying that the mind is in the heart because it came in the Quran. We went over the mental judgments. And since we were talking about the mind, then we started talking about the types or categories of knowledge. Now, I'm not going to go into details about that. And among the things we talked about was the unseen, al-ghaib. So some of what's important to keep in your heart concerning the unseen. Number one, only Allah knows all of the unseen. Only Allah. No prophet knows all the unseen. No prophet knows all the unseen, and no angel knows all the unseen. So that's one. No one knows all of the unseen but Allah. Two, some creations know some of the unseen. Some creations know some of the unseen. Prophets and angels know some of the unseen, whatever was revealed to them. And even saints, awliya, awliya, they might know some of the unseen, but not in a definitive way. Meaning, a wali could be wrong. A wali, he might have a premonition about the future. Or he might have a premonition about something that he didn't see, about something that happened. In the past, but he didn't see it. Like, for example, he might have a premonition that you didn't pray. Fajr, this morning. So he could be right or he could be wrong. This wali. Assalamu Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Yes. Can you spell that one more time? I get rid of here. Yes. So we're talking about knowing the unseen. A creation. Knowing the unseen. We said that some of the creations know some of the unseen. Prophets, they know what Allah revealed to them of the unseen. And angels also, they get revelation. Jibreel, for example, he gets revelation. And he conveys to the angels. And also, on Laylatul Qadr, Allah reveals to the angels what they need to know for the next year. So they know some of the unseen. What about the awliya? The awliya, they sometimes do know some unseen, but not in a definitive way, though. Not like a prophet, because a prophet gets guaranteed revelation, so he's not going to be mistaken. A wali does not get revelation, so he could be mistaken about a premonition he has, for example. A wali might say, for example, uh, you're going to have five kids, for example. So he could be right or he could be wrong. So that's all we're saying. The wali, what he might know of the unseen because of being a wali is not definitive like a prophet. He could be wrong. Like a wali might say to a person, you will be in the Mahdi's army. But then that person dies before the Mahdi appears. Now, one more thing here about this ghaib. 
three, it's valid to say only Allah knows the unseen. If you heard that statement, don't be confused to say this statement. Only Allah knows the unseen. So then someone would say, wait a minute. I thought some of the creations know some of the unseen. How can we say only Allah knows the unseen? The answer is that because when we say only Allah knows the unseen, it means only Allah knows all of the unseen. That's the meaning of that statement. So don't be confused. Only Allah knows the unseen or only Allah knows all of the unseen. You can say both of those. You can say, only Allah knows all of the unseen. That's valid. And you can say, only Allah knows the unseen. That's valid. And you can say, some of the creations know some of the unseen. That's valid. And you can't say, for example, Prophet Muhammad knows the unseen, just like that. That statement, stay away from that. Don't say, Prophet Muhammad knows the unseen. Rather say, Prophet Muhammad knows some of the unseen, whatever Allah revealed to him. And for example, if someone believes that a fortune teller knows the unseen, that's kufr. You don't, even without putting the word all, even if you don't put the word all there, if you just say, a fortune teller knows the unseen, that's kufr. That's blasphemy. But if someone says, the fortune teller might be right or he might be wrong, that's not blasphemy. If someone says, the fortune teller knows the unseen, that's blasphemy. If someone says, the fortune teller might be right or he might be wrong, that's not blasphemy. So that's what we're going to cover about the ghaib, the unseen. Any question there? Question, can you explain why it's kufr to claim to know the unseen? Because only Allah knows the unseen. So whoever says that they know the unseen commits kufr. After we talked about the mind and the categories of knowledge, which we right now didn't talk about these categories, whether it's necessary knowledge or inferred knowledge, we're not going to go into that. But you can review your notes because you've been taking notes, inshallah. You're not just letting the lessons pass like that and you're not catching it. You're not recording it somehow. You're not waiting for someone else to record it so they can give it to you, are you? Are you waiting for someone to give you money so you can pay your rent? I hope not. You're waiting for someone to record the lesson so you can get it from them? So you make sure you take care of yourself like you take care of your own affairs. Find a way to record your lessons. Don't rely on someone else. Take your own notes. Don't rely on someone else. But you can study with someone else to compare notes to make sure your notes are good. So you're going to review your notes there about those categories of knowledge that we're not going to talk about. So after we talked about religious evidence, yani in the process of talking about religious evidence, we talked about the mind. And then we talked about the categories, meaning the different types of knowledge. And we talked about the unseen. Then we talked about the causes of knowledge. What causes knowledge in a creation? The mind is one thing that causes knowledge in a creation, according to details. And the sound senses also, they cause knowledge in the creation, like we just said. You would see that there's a chair right there and there's a shoe right there. 
So when you see that chair, then you know that there's a chair, so that caused knowledge for you. And when you see that shoe, then you know that there's a shoe, so you have knowledge. So that caused knowledge for you, the sound senses. And also truthful information causes knowledge. All of that, of course, has details. And we talked about speculation. Here, speculation means, take note of this here. For us here in this context, speculation or supposition means you're supposing. Don't you say, I suppose that it's like this. So when you say suppose like that, I suppose that it's like this, that means I think it's like this. And that's what we mean by speculation here. You would say, I speculate that the case is like this. That means I think it's like this. What that means is you're not doubting and you're not skeptical. You don't know, you don't know, really, but you're confident that it's right. And you're not doubting, and you're not skeptical. So we talked about that, and we talked about doubt. Doubt, remember, there's important deta detail here for doubt. So add to your notes if you didn't before. Doubt in the belief is different from doubt outside of belief. Because doubt outside of belief, like if you just heard some information, just someone told you something. So we're not talking about issue of belief. Someone told you, for example, uh, the sheikh is sick. So you heard news. The sheikh is sick. Uh, so that doesn't have anything to do with your religious beliefs. So if you doubt about something outside of religion, outside of belief, outside of belief, not outside of religion, outside of belief, doubting means 50-50. You're not sure either way. Both ways, whether it's true or false, are equal to you. That's doubt outside of belief, 50-50. But doubt in the matters of belief doesn't have to be 50-50. Doubt in the matters of belief is even the slightest uncertainty. So if you are 99.9999, 1 million nines sure that Islam is the right religion, then you're a Kafir. Because you're doubting. And ignorance, we said, that means there's two of them, two types of ignorance. One is simple ignorance, which is mere lack of knowledge, simply not knowing something. You simply don't know something. So that's ignorance. You don't know what's in the depth of the seas. You don't know what's in my pocket. So that's a simple, mere ignorance. But then there's another type of ignorance that's bad. That's called, or what it is, is misconception. Misconception. That's ignorance. But misconception is not just that you don't know something. Misconception is that you don't know that you don't know. You don't know is true, but you don't know that you don't know. So that means you think you know, but you don't. So that's a misconception. It's very not good. Always try to avoid misconception. Keep that as one of your very important goals, a life goal. It's a, a highly important life goal to avoid misconception. Being simply ignorant about something is one thing, but being, uh, but having a, Yani, misconstruing something, misconstruing something, that's something altogether different. Simple ignorance in so many cases is unavoidable. Misconception is if you know how to think, 
may Allah enable us, misconception is avoidable. You could fall still into a misconception, but it is very avoidable if you know how to think well. And one of the things that helps you avoid misconception is to realize your own limits. When you don't know something, you stop there and you say, I don't know. Don't indulge in your ignorance. Don't be oblivious to your own ignorance so that you indulge in it and then develop misconceptions. And then the last thing I want to remind, remind you, the last thing I want to remind you from what we, what we reviewed is delusion and imagination. That's not even intellect. Delusion is not intellect. A delusion is an assumption. Or it's a mistake. Or it's an illusion. Assumption means uh, you don't have proof. Mistake means here... In this case, when we talk about a delusion being a mistake, it means you think you're right, but you're wrong. Like, you know how sometimes you could swear you were right, but you just were wrong about something? It doesn't have to be malicious. It could be, you know, like they call a brain fart. You know, your mind slipped somewhere. You, you thought you were right about something, but you were wrong about it. It's a delusion. Or it's an illusion. Delusion could be an illusion. Illusion means looks like it's one thing, but it's not like that. So all of that, you want to avoid it. Delusion, imagination. Yani. You don't want to talk about when it comes to knowing the truth, though. I'm not saying that imagination is bad. But we're talking about knowing the truth of things. When it comes to whether something is true or false, then leave your imagination to the side. When it comes to whether something is true or false, leave your delusions and assumptions to the side. Assumptions that don't have any indication, that is. An assumption could be a supposition, could be possibly. Meaning you saw so many clues, so you thought that it's right. You assume that it's correct based on so many clues. But be careful there. You're learning these here. If you're a beginner in this, and we are, me too. I'm a beginner in this, although I've been studying it, so I just have maybe a better grip on it than someone who's just hearing it for the first time. But really, I'm a beginner in this. So be mindful here. Don't get confused and don't blend these. Okay, so what's a, a speculation or a supposition? It's a confidence. That something is correct. Confidence that something is correct, but it could be wrong, though. But you think it's right. What's a doubt depends on if you're talking about belief or not. If you're not talking about belief, a doubt is 50-50 for you about an issue. You don't know one way or the other. But if you're talking about belief, a doubt is any slightest uncertainty. What's ignorance if you don't know something simply? It's, that's ignorance. That's mere or simple ignorance or sheer ignorance. But if you're unaware of your own ignorance about an issue, so you think you're right when you're wrong, that's a misconception. You have misconstrued. And then you have here scraping the bottom of the barrel delusion. Illusion, assumption here, assumption here, though, in this context of delusion, we're not talking about being confident because of clues. We're talking about not really having a clue. You just assumed something without clue. And imagination, imagination is not a proof. Subhanallah.
let's stop there.